Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming well, good morning, to you from Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming to you from Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming to you from Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming to you from Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming to you from Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming to you from Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming to you from Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming to you from Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming to you from Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming to you from Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming to you from Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming to you from Welcome once again to another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Coming to you from Welcome once again to another episode of open, which hopefully will be fully back open before too long. Um, one of the regular questions we get from our visitors to our outreach programs is, what's new and what's going on this week in astronomy and what are some of the latest things you've discovered? And there are places online where you can get that information and, and there are things going on every day, every evening, every night, new, new information is showing up. And um, so we're going to run a, a periodic set of Cosmic Coffees where we simply cover hot off the press items. And perhaps no one on the staff is better suited that, to talk about that than, than Brian with his encyclopedic knowledge <laughs> of the field. Um, so this is the first of our hot off the press shows uh, with all the latest from the world of astronomy. And we, we hope you enjoy this take on Cosmic Coffee. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Brian to share with you all the all the latest from the world of astronomy. So Brian, take it away. Uh, thanks, Jeff. So as Jeff mentioned, uh, often folks, you know, want, want to know what's what's the latest thing that's happening. And often in science, you know, there's not necessarily a headline, but the sort of the slow accumulation of data rather than some giant breakthrough. And uh, I thought I'd start this morning. I'll do a little screen share here. And uh, one of the most common questions we get is, you know, when are we going to get hit by some giant asteroid and, you know, end of civilization? And, uh, you know, 20 years ago, really 25 years ago, uh, uh, the answer would have been, we don't know, and that we could get hit um, by something large. But in that time, we've, there's been a huge effort to um, actually inventory all the stuff that comes in to the inner part of the solar system that's... Uh, um, in the form of asteroids and comets. And uh, this stuff is uh, worked on by both professional and amateur astronomers. And uh, at least for the, for the uh, asteroids and comets kind of events, um, all the information is collected at the Minor Planet Center, which is shown here, the front page is shown here on, the, uh, on this web page, the website. And uh, they are headquartered in Cambridge, Mass, and uh, collect all of the uh, positional data for the asteroids and, and also issue orbits. And uh, one of the features that uh, they uh, provide is what are called uh, minor planet electronic circulars, which mostly um, issue um, near Earth, the near Earth asteroids. The other routine asteroids out or farther out in the solar system um, uh, are reported in a more uh, uh, less, I would say, uh, less uh, larger intervals, roughly monthly rather than rather than uh, coming out uh, moment by moment. And uh, you can see here at the top of this list of, the, uh, of these recent impacts is a daily orbit update, which will have many thousands of new orbits for objects. And just overnight, um, there was more than a dozen uh, uh, separate circulars for all of these objects that have these 2021 designations um, for new near-Earth asteroids whose orbits have become determinate enough. And uh, I thought we'd just look at the very top one here. And uh, this is a very typical example in the sense that uh, there is, um, a, a, besides the header, there's also a, a huge slew of data here, which are just the positions in the sky uh, moment by moment uh, in, the, in the last um, 24 hours, 36 hours uh, of, this, of this specific object. And uh, the asterisk on the very first line here uh, means that is the discovery observation. And the observatory code at the very end of the line is um, the site where it was actually discovered. And then observer details down below, you can see in the list that this object was discovered by PanStars, which is uh, tel two telescopes actually located on uh, Haleakala in Hawaii. And um, that project uh, is one of the main uh, producers of the new discoveries, surveying the sky at very faint limits and uh, supplying these discoveries. Um, so it was discovered in Hawaii, and then the next, uh, as the night basically proceeded around the Earth, the next time it was picked up was 
at this observatory code J0404, which if you look in the list is a, uh, it's a, a 40 inch, one meter, 40 inch telescope that's located in the Canary Islands. It's actually run by the European Space Agency. And the, the bread and butter of this group is actually to uh, track space debris. But in the, while they're scanning the sky for junk satellites orbiting the Earth, they also pick up the uh, near-Earth asteroids as well. And this is, uh, even though it's funded by the European Space Agency, um, the, 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 the uh, observers are a mix of uh, professionals and semi-professional amateur astronomers. So uh, Marco Micheli, who we know is a professional astronomer, but um, these uh, fellows with the German names towards the end here are amateurs, um, basically semi-professional amateurs. And simil similarly, the next, the next uh, observatory site to pick up this object is H21. This is um, uh, uh, an amateur operation li run literally in a cornfield in Illinois by a guy named Bob Holmes. He has a bunch of telescopes that are run pretty much robotically now and uh, does uh, yeomanly work in following up these, these objects. Um, and so uh, these things get tracked and then once the orbits are determined, actually determinant at all, then they get announced. I might mention that uh, this, uh, this object came quite close to the Earth um, yesterday <laughs> and is on its way out again. And uh, the, this H value here in this data block with the actual orbital elements, um, uh, the H value of about 28 is something that's the size of a bus. And so it's just not very big. And this is very typical of these objects that all the big stuff has been found. Right. And um, <laughs> so a little less than a thousandth of an astronomical unit. And that, right. that weird word there, the moid is yeah, the Mer orbit intersection distance, I think. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> the moid. <laughs> so that's um, to, to put that in maybe more familiar units, that's going to be less than 100,000 miles, right? That's yes. like 90,000 miles or so. So less than the, you know, half, less than, it's only a quarter of the distance of the moon, to the moon. Right. And so right. It, it, it was passed very close, but, uh, but uh, there are many of these objects now. We now know that there are two or three of these objects of this size always within that uh, sphere, within the uh, radius of the, to the moon. So they're Yeah, and something the size of a bus. That would be really impressive if it did come in at that size. Yeah, it would be a, a big, bright, uh, you know, flash in the sky, but would almost entirely burn up and maybe a few crumbs would land on the right. ground. Right. There, we do have a comment that came in that's kind of amusing from, from one of our regular viewers, Chris, says he wonders how many of the younger generation even know where the phrase hot off the press comes from. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, of course, I remember the old, remember those old mimeograph machines with the purple ink, you could practically get high off it. They <laughs> really were hot, yes. <laughs> Very different than a web page. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's worth noting that uh, there are uh, these uh, near earth objects uh, are listed when after they're reported to the Minor Planet Center. And if you have the wherewithal, as you can see, here is the one still waiting to be confirmed. And it's a long list. There's, you know, several dozen waiting to be followed up. So there are large numbers of these objects uh, being worked on um, all the time. Well, another site that's uh, um, sort of related um, in, in the sense that uh, uh, it's showing transient uh, phenomena. Um, in this case, uh, it's a place that's run um, by some uh, academics in, in Eastern US and they, they call it the Astronomer's Telegram. And uh, again, an old fashioned word being repurposed. And these are mostly, um, these are reports, mostly observational reports of transient events. And it's typically uh, uh, what I would call high energy things uh, having to do with supernovae or uh, x-ray sources that have a black hole going around them and stuff like that. Uh, a typical example um, is, uh, well, one, the, well, one thing I'll mention is there's a, a quite bright naked eye visible ordinary nova that's uh, erupted in Cassiopeia in the last few weeks and it had kind of a, a slow start but uh, has had, had its final um, outburst and uh, um, they're going to show uh, this one right here. <clears throat> um, this is some follow-up work by uh, a fellow named Ulisa Monari, who's in, in northern Italy at 
Padova, and uh, he heads up a group that includes um, folks following up these novi and getting uh, data, specifically spectra, um, to look at the chemical composition and the structure of the of these objects as they go as they as they evolve through their cycle of of, of uh, the eruption itself. So again, this is a. Uh, 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 example where folks are uh, around the world, uh, almost anywhere in the world, um, doing this work. And uh, this is something that amateurs are getting spectra of, as well as looking, just looking at the brightness. So this is a site that does that. Um, yeah, Brian, some... question, question in the yes. chat. Well, a couple of questions and a couple of comments in the chat. Um, so I, I don't know if you can occasionally, if you're not a Zoom your browser, because uh, I think on the, the YouTube window, some of the text is occasionally coming yeah. in kind of small, um, which I, I totally understand. I think it's a little more to sort of show people where these where these sites are. And um, a couple of questions going back to um, the, the near Earth asteroids. Oh, so question from uh, how large does, does a rock need to be? Maybe it depends on what it's made of before it's a real threat of impact. Ah, okay. <laughs> That's a good question. It is. Um, it obviously it ranges. I mean, if, if something like this 10 meter, eight or 10 meter diameter, you know, bus sized uh, object came in, um, it's not a danger um, because it, they generally hit the atmosphere uh, rather fast. And I mean, these things have been observed and um, um, actually hitting, hitting the earth and um, happens roughly once a week. And uh, so those pretty much uh, disintegrate and burn up. And so that some pieces come down, but really not very much. And yeah. so obviously, as you get larger and larger, the, the threat increases to um, things that are a few hundred meters in diameter would be uh, quite a, you know, would knock all the all the terrestrial news, so to speak, off the headlines. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Yeah, up to something like a kilometer, so say two thirds of, of a mile, between half and a whole mile diameter, those are real civilization threatening objects. Right. And we think we know where uh, basically all of those are because um, we've been scanning the sky for very in a big way for 25 years, including at Lowell um, yep. uh, with the Lonios project in the, in the aughts, um, yep. finding the larger objects. And we think we have something like 95, 98% of those actually known. And right. so the, any kind of a, a big collision is many, many decades even centuries off. So. Right. I, I love the way that um, back when Ted, Ted Bowl was here, and obviously you worked extensively with him on the whole Lanios project, and he, he would always start his talks. He had this slide that I always loved that had three sentences on it, which says, a giant asteroid is going to hit the Earth. We are all going to die. <laughs> not in that order. <laughs> yeah. um, and the two statements may not be related. <laughs> right, too, right. Too strongly correlated. <laughs> but I think, I think the, it was reported, the, for instance, the Chelyabinsk object, which is a pretty well-known recent right. event, was around bus-sized. And you yeah. know, that was enough to knock windows out and make a real show in the sky. And then whatever it was that made Meteor Crater just you know, 30 miles from where we're sitting, they think was well, like a hundred feet across or something. Yeah, something like 50, 50 meters, maybe 150 feet across. Yeah, and that obviously made a whole a mile across. So it doesn't have to be yes. too big because your your energy goes up rather substantially. As, as, right, right. Um, I, so then this follows on your mention of Lanios to another question from Chris in the chat. So what kind of limiting magnitude is needed for the NAO work and what's a minimum useful sized mirror or aperture telescope, telescope yeah. to do the work? Um, Interestingly, that that uh, that number first went up, but then it just come down, <laughs> um, in the sense that uh, 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 for a while the amateurs were in, upping their game to keep up with the professional discovery, so that um, they could get down to something like twenty first or twentieth or twenty first magnitude, which is quite faint um, in the ordinary sense of very dim objects. But what's happened is that people are now with the technology and the cameras is. Uh, advanced so it's that you can, and the software um, has advanced so that you can stack images, even relatively short exposure, stack a whole bunch of pictures together, you know, an hour's worth of, of 30 second exposures and pick up very faint objects. And so um, uh, this, a lot of these folks only have something like a 16 inch telescope, um, but are able to go as faint as the big telescopes by doing this stacking of the images. But instead of just taking one 
you know, one minute exposure, they're having to stack dozens of them. Yeah, but this is that. really faint. You know, when we're talking 20th to 21st magnitude, this is now something like what, 250 to 500 times fainter than Pluto, which is right, right. not particularly <laughs> bright in itself. Right. So they, they're quite faint objects. And there are people doing this. Uh, uh, an example is uh, uh, um, uh, there, this fellow, a British guy named uh, Peter Bertwistle, who's in, you know, in the cloudy UK, and he's, <laughs> he's a retired engineer, so he knows what he's doing. But uh, he's done this, you know, tremendous work uh, getting light curves and also the astrometry, the measuring the positions of the these quite faint, fast, very fast moving objects as they as they whiz by the Earth. And he's got a 16 inch telescope in his backyard. Yep, yep. And he's not at a mountaintop site, you know, a remote mountaintop site. He's in, you know. And let me let me interject here. I'd like to admit these, you know, uh, citizen scientists and amateur observers, you know, are so skilled and have such high quality equipment. You know, one uh, very tangential area where we think citizen science is going to become increasingly important is observations of satellites. Uh, with the advent of these satellite constellations, a, a comprehensive observing network was one of the recommendations from our SATCON 1 conference last year. And we had a number of amateurs attending that conference. So, you know, for any amateur observers who might be viewing now or seeing this, this show, you know, if, if you're interested in getting into that kind of work too, as well as say NEO stuff, it's going to be increasingly needed and valued by the the astronomical community, and I think the operators who are trying to work to lower the brightness of their satellites. So just wanted to get that in there. Okay, now we're on to Astro PH. What's this? Yeah, so uh, uh, one, sort of my, one of my favorite astronomical sites is <laughs> this uh, uh, facility that was actually started at Los Alamos Laboratory um, 20 some years ago, and has been, and has decamped to back east to Cornell, is now hosted in, in, at Cornell University in New York. And this is a, a site is now expanded away from uh, physics and astronomy to all fields of science, even economics and computing science, um, where uh, folks can uh, post um, papers that are either submitted or about to be submitted or have been accepted to a journal. And uh, uh, the, the advantage is you get to see the paper before it actually gets published, and in, and in many cases, uh, even before it's been submitted. So you can be up on, on the very latest stuff that your colleagues are, are uh, trying to do. And sometimes these, if the papers are uh, not, have not been refereed, um, then um, they can be, you know, retracted or are just wrong or considerably revised by the time they show up in print um, or on, an, uh, the, I guess most journals are not printed, but um, on an online site where it's actually been properly refereed. And so uh, well, I thought I'd, uh, the, the fun sort of, this is sort of the, the improvised jazz section of this. <laughs> uh, I haven't looked at this since, uh, since it got posted last night. And uh, so we'll see see what's here. And I'll, I will say um, that uh, I don't know everything by a long shot, and uh, probably have some misconceptions about things. But um, there are, and so in, uh, we'll probably skip some of these because I have no idea even what the title means. And <laughs> and uh, but the the papers can be from. Uh, People everywhere in the world, um, and and the and uh, uh, not necessarily where you think they are. So that the person with the Brazilian name, you know, is actually in Belgium, and the German fellow is in Chile, and uh, <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah. So really um, quickly before we dive into these, um, just. Uh, Question came in, I think, that re refers back to a little bit earlier in the show. Um, just reiterate, what's the Astronomer's Telegram? And I think that's at astronomerstelegram.org. And that's- Yes. Just, yeah. Yeah. Just a, a site with uh, where people- it's Mostly can transient, transient ob observations of transient phenomena and mostly high energy uh, stuff having to do with supernovae or X-ray sources and things like that from spacecraft, right. often and with ground-based uh, follow-up that's done in the visible or the uh, near infrared parts of the spectrum. Yeah, I think Heather posted that link in the chat so people can get to it. Um, one of yeah. our regular viewers, Glenn Frank, also wants to know if I'm standing on Charon. Um, yes, in fact, I am. Uh, <laughs> I and I have, we figured out a, a really clever way to get around the four hour light travel time. Don't worry about the details. We, we've got this well in hand. So, 
All right, let's let's see what's new. And I mean, the first one, as as Tom Lehrer once said, this I know from nothing, right? Quantum yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, this this is a uh, um, so so this can include observational stuff, modeling, uh, uh, and uh, where you would combine theory and observations as well as pure theoretical stuff, often quite um, uh, speculative. And uh, this is one of those cases, the very first item. Um, and what, you know, and, and a lot of the cos there will be cos cosmology stuff that to me really deals with um, particle physics and not really, you know, astronomers going out to a telescope and looking at the sky. And uh, this is one of those examples. And uh, um, this has to do with theory and at a, it, oddly enough or paradoxically often the cosmology dealing with the very largest thing you know the entire universe as a whole often uh, comes down to looking at, at subatomic particles and this is one of those things that I you know I think maybe there's someone on the staff here who would be able to explain this in 25 words or less but it is not me <laughs> so we're going to skip this one and go to the next one which is uh, uh, um, uh, again uh, not really speculative uh, so much as uh, anticipating what can be done with the James Webb Space Telescope and what things might be possible with looking at very high or very high redshift, very extremely distant galaxies. And this one is, uh, if you can read the fine print, says this, but this is a, a paper that's been accepted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, which is generally a rapid publication um, mode of, of uh, of uh, getting getting results out in this case um, doing modeling to saying oh here's what we'll be able to do with a certain instrument that's proposed to go on the James Webb, James Webb Space Telescope. And then the third paper is um, actually looking at taking actual uh, data and applying models to this uh, to um, in this case uh, these brown dwarfs these uh, very cool objects that are between what you would call an ordinary star and uh, hot planets. And again, this is a, uh, a, a you know, international group of folks, includes Mike Liu, who I've worked with, Mark Marley, um, mm -hmm. who's at NASA Ames in California, and other folks, um, including at uh, Arizona State in um, Tempe. Yeah, and that's a question we, we get a lot in the public programs is, is you know, when, when does a star stop being a star and become a planet? And the, there's this fuzzy gray area where you're right at that critical mass range where... Yeah, I tend to think that, you know, like in a lot of uh, things in nature, that it, there's just, there's no hard line, uh, although you can make an arbitrary definition, but there's just a, uh, a continuum of things, phenomena out in the world that, uh, um, you know, go between what we are calling ordinary stars that are have a have fusion going on in the center to things that are just kind of hot in the middle <laughs> and uh, very dim objects and yeah, no. it's it's just it's a, it's a continuum yeah um, it is there's a, a nice uh, comment and a question comment um from uh, book davies another one of our regulars uh pointing out that his lo his local astronomy club does get involved uh in neo discovery and working with NASA in that context, that's great. And yep. a really good question from uh, Nicholas Hernandez asking that how similar is AstroPH to ADS, the, the Astrophysics Data System? Ah, okay, so I mean, it, it's turning out that originally the uh, AstroP or the AstroPH, this preprint server, was kind of in the gray area between not published and actual proper publication. But uh, as things have developed now, the uh, Astro the stuff from the archive site here uh, is getting indexed by AstroPH, or excuse me, indexed by the ADS at Harvard. And so they, it sort of becomes part of the literature that gets cited. And um, so that there are uh, codes basically to be able to in re refer to papers in, in a yet, you know, even more recent paper, you can cite an Astro PH paper that hasn't been published yet or is in only uh, preprint form. So it's uh, the, the folks who do the indexing and the bibliography for astronomy have had to, you know, roll with the times and not be so dogmatic about what's published right. and what's not published. Right, and, and we can use another term that our, our younger viewers probably won't know about, but I mean, ADS in a sense is this enormous card catalog uh, you could use to search back through the entire literature and find just about whatever reference you want. 
you know, so that's the ADS acronym is for uh, Astrophysics Data System, which was uh, started and still headquartered at Harvard, where folks are, it's sort of a bibliographic database yeah. um, in the sense that actual papers, um, once they're indexed and are online, can be uh, accessed um, through either keywords or titles or authors. Um, and it's tied into the Simbad database, which is an, uh, an object by object uh, bibliographic database that's headquartered in Strasbourg in France, mm -hmm. and also the uh, NASA Extragalactic Database, which is at Caltech, which yeah. deals uh, pretty exclusively with galaxies, which is a big, uh, you know, research area in astronomy, not just stars, but, but galaxies. So you can see by these titles, there's uh, quite a lot of variety in these, uh, in, the, in, the, in the research, and you can see by the names, if you can read the names, that um, the people are all over the world <laughs> and uh, just by the sorts of names that you can see and um, uh, uh, often there and this is a, an example where there's a, um, a basically a, a cultural meme I guess you'd say so espresso is the name of a is the name of a project and um, and, and a, a set of models for having to do with ultra high energy cosmic rays and in the nuclei of galaxies specifically where you get these uh, very tightly collimated jets and uh, dealing with the models of those um, involves that big long word magneto hydrodynamics um, that um, is uh, yep. uh, again a, a real hard physics kind of um, kind of thing a word we have used before on Cosmic Coffee, yes. just, uh, stellar <laughs> cycles. <clears throat> so farther down the list here, um, there are uh, 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 papers that, here's a paper that has to do with a, a specific um, telescope or a, an, an array of telescopes that's in the northern um, part of Chile at very high altitude in the Atacama Desert. That's looking at, at high energy uh, particles um, hitting the Earth's atmosphere and then are measured. Um, and then tying that into uh, radio wavelength data <clears throat> at, at, um, at, at longer wavelengths. Um, uh, again, this is a tremendous, um, very, lar very large <laughs> uh, collaboration. They probably left off a few hundred authors here <laughs> if they actually included everyone. But you can see by the names that the names are all from all sorts of cultures and well, uh, around the world. They do include all of the the names. I think the, the author list on some of the LIGO papers with the, the gravity yeah. waves was, I mean, it took two pages just to get through the author list. Right. And they'll, they'll have a list like this and then they'll say an 860 additional co-authors. <laughs> <clears throat> um, let's see if we can scroll down here to uh, one that has some semblance of uh, um, uh, relevance to, um, to things that you might know about. Um, Here's people are interested in, in uh, for instance, in, in having to see whether there are caves on Mars that are sheltered from uh, various uh, uh, things that, uh, you know, environmentally bad things for life. And uh, people are, are wondering whether you could actually have a spacecraft go and look in caves or whether there could be life growing in caves that are um, on Mars, particularly from lava tubes, since there's a lot of activity. Um, on, uh, there has been a lot of act, uh, volcanic activity on Mars historically in the geologic history of Mars. And uh, you know, here, here these folks are proposing a, 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 a spacecraft that would go down to Mars and either look in a lava tube without drilling, it says. <laughs> so you don't have to have too many magical things um, you know, <laughs> happen for the mission to be successful. So it's just you know, putting out an idea um, and uh, an engineering, an engineering idea, right? Though actually, the one right above it catches my eye too, because I've always <clears> thought <throat> these uh, dynamical models of solar system evolution were are really interesting um, and and tell you a lot about how how planetary systems evolve over billions of years. Yeah, we we think that there were probably uh, a bunch of things that were like Saturn and Jupiter um, in the early history of the solar system, maybe, you know, a dozen or something. And uh, through gravitational and tidal interactions, they, there was a paper called the eviction of the excess oligarchs. <laughs> and one time that, uh, so that um, most of the big planets got tossed out of the solar system or got uh, 
got thrown into the sun at, at a very young age. So that's a, there were just the two big ones left. And uh, as these, as the big planets migrated, they start for complicated reasons, migrate outward and shuffle the planets, what the remaining planets around. And again, this is a, uh, <clears throat> a, a modeling thing that uh, has to do with uh, trying to figure out you know, how this actually happens and the details of that and why we see so many, um, we, when we discover most of these planets, particularly the hot Jupiters, um, that they're always, the reason they're hot is they're very close to the host star. And uh, whereas at least in our solar system, things have moved out and are, are rather distant. So again, this is an incremental kind of a modeling, uh, <clears throat> modeling proposal. Right. That, uh, I, I know in the comments, um, it appears, um, you know, both Chris and Nicholas are familiar with MHD. So, you know, they want to come over and help us figure out stellar cycle. <laughs> Be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so here's a very early origin of isotrop isotopically distinct nitrogen in the inner solar system protoplanet. So this is more or less how the chemistry of the disk of the early solar system uh, uh, arranged itself. And this is a topic where, you know, you can look at just the, di the, the for the very young stars, looking at just the disk itself, that's uh, the accreting of the gas and the dust onto the planets and the details of that having, that have to do with basically physical chemistry or even organic chemistry. Um, of, of how that process uh, uh, settles out by the time you actually have a star and a, a, a settled group of, of planets. Um, um, yeah, so part, Jim Davies caught the, I, my eye also caught this one wondering if galaxies die, so galactic evolution is a, a, yes. a well-known one. Yeah, so people work on, on um, the, basically the process of how the galaxy, we see very distant galaxies, extremely distant galaxies from the early universe in, uh, uh, for instance, Hubble Space Telescope images, and they are different than the ones that are near to us. Right. And uh, so, uh, so there's obviously a strong galaxy evolution process that's, again, not very, we, we see it happening, but we don't know the details, other than we know that there are stars and there's gas and dust, and those go through a, a, a cyclic process. Right. Um, uh, from beginning to end. So Just again, the abstract really quickly, they're sort of interpreting dead is these galaxies that are just not forming stars. Um, right, so so we see in, in our own galaxy and in many nearby galaxies that the star process, star forming process is running at various rates. Sometimes they're uh, a star, a galaxy can be completely covered with uh, very uh, active star forming regions and others. I mean, the Andromeda galaxy is an actually an example where there's not really very much star formation happening you know, or only at a moderate level. And uh, galaxies go to the other extreme where there's, they are, there's so little star formation happening that they've become very faint and uh, very dim and uh, actually quite difficult to detect. Yeah, right, right. Now, if you scroll, go to tw number 24, because that really, really that's, well that's pretty you. close to home, uh, <laughs> adult minimum. <laughs> so, oh, so, um, so this, uh, there's a lot of work uh, related to this uh, activity on the sun and historical activity on the sun since the time of Galileo or even earlier um, from direct observation of sunspots. And then the tie-in of that, uh, that activity on the sun to um, to the climate change and uh, what relation there is, if any. And um, so there's a lot of folks working in Europe and in the, and in the, in the Eastern, Eastern Asia looking at historical documents um, related to people, you know, who, uh, people who are actually making records of the sunspots with a small telescope. And, uh, and then uh, uh, work those, that, not all of that work has been, uh, you know, uh, merged into the database of of the uh, uh, historical observations. So this is a paper that's actually in uh, the Astrophysical Journal um, um, where uh, folks have um, gotten, uh, looked at uh, some previously unindexed un data um, who was a fellow evidently observing uh, uh, in near Innsbruck in Austria and uh, who was uh, using a small telescope, three and a half inch telescope um, to count 
uh, sunspots. And so this helps fill in the gaps of our observational uh, record of the sunspot, of the spottedness on the sun, and uh, helps fill in this. So this is a, there's a, a group of folks, you know, around the world who are digging into this stuff, um, into the, you know, basically unpublished historical documents, whether they're in, you know, the Vatican Library or hidden in some, some uh, library in Spain or whatever it is. If there's people yep. are digging this stuff out. Yep, these historic records are, and then, um, yeah, 25, whoo, talk about heavy duty MHD. This is, this is, you know, the processes that generate stellar cycles are <clears throat> not understood in detail. And uh, people are still trying to understand, you know, how the solar and stellar dynamos work. And that's, you know, Yuri Tumre has been in, in that for a long time. Yeah, right. And this is, this is a, uh... A conference. Uh, it was an online conference, the, the, the 20.5th Cambridge Workshop. <laughs> so they they had a came. There's this uh, historical Cambridge Workshop on the cool stars, um, which includes the sun. And uh, because they did it online, they had instead of having a, a, a the conference at a, the workshop at a longer interval, they had one intervening because they could do it online uh, just several months ago now. And so they they called it the half. The half one between the two main conferences. Yeah, that's, that's a great workshop too and, and we yeah. did um uh, i mean cool stars has become you know probably the major specialty workshop in in this field of, of astrophysics um, usually with 350 to 400 attendees now and we hosted that right here in flagstaff in 2014 thanks to huge effort by our faculty member gerard van bell that was that was great to have it here yeah, that was, it was great to see so many folks here um, from, uh, from uh, you know, worldwide. All over the world, yeah. All over the world came coming for that because it really is one of the most important conferences for the lower lower mass stars. It's, right. Uh, yeah, it's, cool even, though it's the, even though it's the Cambridge, called the Cambridge Workshop, it's a, a traveling workshop. And <laughs> yeah, and cool, of course, doesn't mean they're, you know, shades and, and hookahs or anything, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, it, it, it start, I define that as stars with subsurface convection zones. So sort of yeah. late A and on down. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, so here's one that I would uh, look at a little bit, which is a, an observational work on an open, actually two um, uh, uh, relatively recently identified open clusters of stars where um, folks have uh, basically not had to take, well, it looks like they have, taken ground-based uh, multicolor data with a telescope and then merged that with um, spacecraft data from, from the Gaia spacecraft and also evidently ground-based data from the PanSTARRS uh, project, which we uh, saw at the beginning of the, of the program having to do with asteroids. But they have published a, a very large catalog of, of multicolor photometry of just stars and galaxies. Um, and so, and that data is publicly available. And um, so these folks um, who all have South Asian Indian names, very common, uh, Maria, Joshi, Ellen, El Sanuri, and Sharma um, have studied these two groups of stars to get the distances and the ages of these, of these clusters in the sky. And uh, it would be, since I have a, 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 an abiding interest in open clusters, um, this would be one that I will look at once we're offline here. And so that's, you know, useful um, information about these clusters of stars, probably intermediate age um, clusters that um, are nevertheless, sometimes, sometimes uh, this, these are relatively obscure catalog names. They're not NGC objects or Messier objects, um, but uh, so probably aren't ones that you would look at in a telescope or you would only see a few, a handful of stars, but um, nevertheless of interest in just the inventorying of, of uh, what's out there in the galaxy. I was hoping to see um, some of the acronyms that, that show up. Um, one, of, one of my favorites that are these often cultural memes, one of which uh, is a, uh, a galaxy uh, spectroscopic survey that's called Most Def. And uh, if you're uh, over, over 40, um, you might need to have, not, might need to have explained that Most Def was a, is a rapper who in himself is a, a old school rapper. But um, often these um, acronyms will, will have a, a cultural connection that, that's- um, Or they're a little strange, if you could scroll up a bit, because one went by, that's a good example. Um, it's uh, a little farther, a little farther. Integral Rhapsody. 
This, so, so check out the capitalized letters. Yes. Uh, reconstruction of high contrast, polarized source. So yeah. they're working hard to get the get the word out of this here. <laughs> yeah, often the uh, the acronyms are contri quite contrived with using just about any letters or even added ones or subjected ones, or often the acronyms themselves are a compound of two acronyms. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes they just work, like Joe Lama's Lowell Observatory Solar Telescope. Lost. <laughs> lost. Just perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's some we could talk about here. Uh, or, and so here's some, some of the LIGO, LIGO uh, work, um, looking at the modeling of these uh, gravitational wave events that have been really? found. Um, looking at you know where they are in the sky. So again, this is um, you know incremental kinds of work, both modeling and trying to figure out where things actually fit in. Um, ah, and there's a CTA paper, the Cherenkov Telescope Array. Yes, right. We were competing for one of the Northern Hemisphere sites. We were not selected, but it was certainly an interesting process to be part of. Yeah, and so this one is, uh, Journal of Physical Geology or Graphics or something. Yeah. <laughs> J J Phys G is not a not an ac not an abbreviation I I'm familiar not with. I have to admit. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so the Cherenkov telescopes uh, are going to be in different sites around the world, but are looking at high energy uh, particles hitting the uh, Earth's atmosphere and generating uh, these cosmic rays that can get detected. Here's another big collaboration looking at variable stars in globular clusters, and mostly in the southern sky near the galactic center. Um, <clears throat> these are familiar names to me, partly because I follow the star cluster work. Um, Dante Miniti here is a, a, a relatively senior fellow who's then uh, Marcio Catalan, also are uh, senior fellows who are probably you know coordinating all of this work. <clears throat> um, Dante Miniti, for what it's worth, is a Jesuit priest, and so you can, uh, it's definitely the case that uh, religious folks are involved in doing science. Yep, all the way back to Father Seiji. Right, back to the beginning. And uh, I see some other familiar names. Doug Geisler is uh, one of these, he's an American astronomer, but one of these folks who uh, started going to Chile and early in his career and ended up uh, moving there, living down there. Uh, the next, the next pick, the next uh, uh, paper is uh, says accepted for publication in the Planetary Science Journal it has to do with um, um, the comet Virtanen or Wirtanen um, that uh, came through a couple of years ago, and uh, is led by colleagues of ours, Mike Kelly and Tony Farnham, who are at the um, at the University of Maryland. <clears throat> well, Tony's, Tony's actually now at the U.S. Naval Academy. Ah, okay, that's yes, right. <clears throat> and uh, so they've been, they are longtime comet experts and have been uh, working on looking, at, particularly Mike Kelly, looking particularly at outbursts of ordinary, com ordinary comets, why they would have these outbursts, whether it's, um, uh, we know that comets have done this in the past, but actually trying to dig down into the physics and what's happening on the surface that causes the, these outbursts. So Tony and uh, Mike Kelly and then this uh, long list of long list of co-authors um, from around the world. They've obviously gotten, uh, I know that Mike Kelly has gotten, and Tony have gotten um, observations from telescopes at various places around the world, um, including the Canary Islands and in Chile and Hawaii <coughs> and, in, and in India. Um, so that uh, there's a long list of collaborators who've been actually grabbing the data for them to work from. <laughs> <clears throat> at the um, end of that author list, uh, number 50, there is Jeremy Treglon-Reed, who's actually uh, been one of the major contributors in the satellite constellations. Uh, ah, okay. Well, he's mm -hmm. been deeply involved with that. Um, so I'm going to ask Heather and JB at this point to ask for any final questions in the chat. Um, the day marches on, zooms on. Yes, we, we can go on for a long time with this. We'll a long time. <laughs> we are up to our usual 45 minutes, so let's <clears> ask <throat> for any further questions. Um, and um, let's see, yeah, so Glenn Frank asked, can we post some of the, yeah, okay. Uh, Heather's gonna post those, Glenn, some of the website links so you can see where to get to these. Maybe just uh, 
scroll through really quickly, Brian, see if anything else catches your eye. And then yeah, well, we're at the bottom of the ordinary uh, group. And then these cross lists, I'll just say, are almost always uh, um, coming from the high energy and cosmology section and of the, of the, of the, of the work and are often highly um, theoretical and speculative. Um, again, so this is mo much more um, uh, crazy, very detailed, high energy physics, um, rather than what I think of as astronomy, going out to a telescope and looking at the stars kind of thing. So we're, this is a good place to stop. Okay, so we'll see if there are any other questions. And you can see here, you know, we're up to, this is this is the day's edition. On, yeah, one day. <laughs> uh, we're up to fifty papers, and and one reason you know astronomy is is specialized like any other field. You, I mean, I mean, you could you basically have time to do what we've done, which is kind of look at the titles, look at the abstracts. Oh, and here's what here's sort of what folks are doing, but to actually read all of this is way beyond what what anyone could do. Um, yeah. Some um, of us, some of us are, are down to just looking at co-authors that we know. <laughs> that, that's it. <laughs> that's all the farther you can get. <laughs> so one, one final question before we sign off from Jim Davies. Is there a site for solar system news? I mean, certainly we, we saw some solar system papers listed here. And, and the, you know, the Minor Planet Center obviously is, is covering small bodies in the solar system. Yeah, so I mean, as, as far as I know, there is not such a thing. Um, most of the stuff that is not small bodies, the comets, not the comets, and not the asteroids, uh, I guess I would say generally doesn't need to have, you know, stuff issued out in a, you know, an instant manner, like a headline like this. And uh, so that you would see the papers like the comet papers from Mike Kelly or other ones having to do with asteroids on the Astro PH or in the journal websites where they have tables of contents, for instance. Yeah. Okay, well, with that, we are going to plan to do some of these um, hot off the web page shows from time <laughs> to time and just survey what's up in astronomy. You can sort of see what people have been looking at and thinking about it, at least for today. Um, always interesting to kind of catch up and, and take the temperature of the field. So I think we'll, we'll stop here and, and certainly uh, look forward to welcoming Brian back for in the near future for one of these other shows. Um, in the meantime, I uh, hope everybody stays well. Thanks for joining. Thanks for viewing. And we'll see you next time. Bye, all.